Today we got some more actual history about the French and Indian War. We'll be reading from this book, The Pennsylvania German and the French and Indian War, a historical sketch. This book was published all the way back in 1905 by Henry Melcher Muhlenberg Richards. This story picks up after the Delaware Indians have been massacring the German settlers of central Pennsylvania. Conrad Weiser, a leader of the Germans, tries to gain assistance from the governor in quelling the attacks. We'll also hear about Regina Hartman, a nine-year-old German girl who was captured by the Delaware Indians in 1755. There was no intention on the part of Conrad Weiser to rest quietly and allow matters to take their own course. He promptly called together several of the prominent men of the locality for consultation. In the absence of any action by the government worthy of mention, and without means of their own for defense, their first duty seemed to be to spur on the government to do something, and do it in a systematic way. Therefore, on November 24, 1755, the following statement was forwarded. Honored Sir, we the subscribers thereof, being met together to think on means of how to withstand our cruel Indian enemy, thought fit to acquaint your honor of the miserable condition the back inhabitants of these parts are in. First, since the last cruel murder committed by the enemy, most of the people of Tulpehocken have left their habitation. Those in Heidelberg have moved their effects. Bethel Township is entirely deserted. Second, there is no order among the people. One cries one thing and another another thing. They want to force us to make a law that they should have a reward for every Indian which they kill. They demand such a law of us, with their guns cocked pointing it toward us. Third, the people are so incensed, not only against our cruel enemy, the Indians, but also we beg leave to inform your honor against the governor and assembly, that we are afeard that they will go down in a body to Philadelphia and commit the vilest outrages. They say they will rather be hanged than to be butchered by the Indians, as some of their neighbors have been lately, and the poverty that some are in is very great. Fourth, Yesterday we sent about 70 men to the mountains to take possession of several houses and to range the woods along the mountains in Burke County on the west side of Shulkill. The same number are sent to the back parts of Lancaster County. We promised them two shillings a day, two pounds of bread, two pounds of beef and a gill of rum a day, and ammunition and that for 40 days, or till we shall receive your honor's order. We persuaded ourselves that your honor will not leave us in the lurch. We must have done such a thing or else leave our habitation. If no worse and all this would not do, we and others of the freeholders have been obliged to promise them a reward of four pistols for every enemy Indian man that they should kill. Many things more we could mention, but we don't care to trouble your honor any further. Do therefore conclude and beg leave to subscribe ourselves, honored sir, your very humble servants, Conrad White. Weiser, Emanuel Carpenter, and Adam Simon Coon. P.S. I cannot forbear to acquaint your honor of a certain circumstance of the late unhappy affair. One Kobel, his wife and eight children, the eldest about fourteen years, and the youngest fourteen days, were flying before the enemy, he carrying one, and his wife and a boy another of the children, when they were fired upon by two Indians very nigh, but hit only the man upon his breast, though not dangerously. The Indians then came with their tomahawks, knocked the woman down, but not dead. They intended to kill the man, but his gun, though out of order so that he could not fire, Fire, kept them off. The woman recovered so far and seated herself upon a stump, with her babe in her arms, and gave it suck. And the Indians, driving the children together, spoke to them in high Dutch. They said, Be still, we won't hurt you. Then they struck a hatchet into the woman's head, and she fell upon her face with her babe under her, and the Indians trod on her neck and tore off her scalp. The children then ran. But four of them were scalped, among which was a girl of eleven years of age, who related the whole story, of the scalped, to her alive, and liked to do well. The rest of the children ran into the bushes, and the Indians after them, but our people coming near to them, hallowed and made noise. The Indians then ran, and the rest of the children were saved. They ran into a yard by a woman that lay behind an old log, with two children of her own. There were about seven or eight of the enemy at that time. I am, honored sir, yours obedient, Conrad Weiser. 
I intend to send a wagon down to Philadelphia for blankets and other necessaries for the people, on their guard under the mountain, and I hope it will be then in your honor's power to supply us. The governor was fully aroused by these horrible atrocities and endeavored to perform his duty. It would be unjust to him were we not, in concluding this record, to recite a portion of his letter of November 27th to General Shirley as follows. Dear Sir, since writing the letter herewith, I have received intelligence that the Indians have crossed the Susquehanna and fallen upon the inhabitants to the southward of the mountains at and near a place called Tulpahocken, about sixty miles from here, where they had, when the express came away, burnt several houses and killed such of the inhabitants as could not escape from them. The settlement they are now destroying is one of the finest in the province. The lands are very rich and well improved. My assembly have now been sitting ever since the third instant, but have done nothing for the defense of the province, nor raised any supplies. The bill they have proposed for that purpose, being of the same kind of the one I had before refused to pass, and which they know I have no power by my commission to pass it. Such a conduct, while the country is bleeding, seems to me to merit the severest censure. The events just related were but a part of the terrible occurrences in the Tulpahocken region during the fall of 1755. Among those hitherto unrecorded is one told by the Honorable D.C. Henning of Pottsville, who received it from Daniel Ney, a resident of Summit Station in Shulkill County, and over 80 years of age at the time. Mr. Ney's great-grandfather was one of the early settlers of the locality. His grandfather and granduncle, Michael, were both youths at the time when the incident occurred. One day in the fall, the two brothers drove to the woods along the mountain, with a team and skeleton wagon to take home a load of firewood for the winter, which they had previously cut and prepared. Michael rode on one of the horses while his brother was seated on the wagon. When they reached the place for loading, two Indians sprang out from the bushes and each attacked his intended victim. During the scuffle that ensued, the Indian who had attacked Michael was being worsted, and the other who had attacked the realtor's grandfather, seeing this, dealt his victim a stunning blow on the head, knocking him insensible for the time. He then went to the assistance of the other, and the two together killed Michael. Meanwhile, the grandfather regained consciousness, but finding himself unable to do anything, he feigned death. After the Indians were satisfied that they had dispatched Michael, they turned their attention to the other, but finding him likewise dead, as they supposed, they concluded to hide the bodies. They then scalped Michael, bound his hands and feet, stretched him on a pole, and carried him away a little distance, and buried him in some leaves. The other, as soon as their backs were turned in this rude obsequy to the dead, crept away and was soon on his feet, and running for his life towards home. So fearful was he that they had likewise killed all his people at home, and that the Indians might return to the house, that he hid himself away in some hay at the barn. After remaining there for a long while, he stole stealthily to the house, where, to his surprise and joy, he found the others all still alive, but had a sad tale to tell them. The alarm was sounded, and the neighbors formed a posse, who found the body of Michael, but the Indians had fled. They followed their trail to the crest of the Blue Mountains, but the dangers attending the pursuit were too great for them to go any further. The wound inflicted on the survivor was a deep tomahawk cut on the head, but he was healed, lived to a ripe old age, and left a large posterity behind him. As early as 1750, a small settlement of Germans was made at Orwigsburg in Schulkill County. They were practically the first to occupy that locality. At the period of which we are writing, sparse settlements had been made in the vicinity of the present town of Pine Grove, and elsewhere both east and west. Among these was George Everhart, his wife and family of sons and daughters, who had cleared for himself some land and built on it a home near what is now Pine Grove. As the Indian depredations spread eastward from the Swatara Gap, they quickly reached him. Everhart was slain and scout, together with his wife and all their children, save little Margaret, then but six years of age, who was a witness to the brutal butchery that made her an orphan, friendless, and homeless. For what they failed to accomplish with the tomahawk and scalping knife, they wrought with the torch. Probably the attractiveness of her person had spared her life, only to be led to a hopeless captivity. 
Happily, in time, she was rescued by Colonel Bouquet and returned to her friends. She was married on February 8, 1771 to John Salada and became the ancestress of a large posterity. The most pathetic of all tales is the comparatively well-known one of Regina, the German captive so-called. It has been told in many different forms and with many poetical embellishments. If for no other reason, it will bear telling again, and in truth, the story of the Pennsylvania Germans in the French and Indian War would be incomplete without it. Our knowledge of the case is obtained from the letter of Rev. Henry Melcher Muhlenberg, which appears in the Holisch Nachrichten, and of which the following translation from the German has been made by Rev. J. W. Early of Reading, Pennsylvania. In February 1765, a widow and her adult daughter from Rev. Kurt's congregation came to see me. This visit cheered me very much because of the peculiar circumstances of the case. The widow spoken of was a native of the old and renowned imperial city, Reutlingen, in the Duchy of Württemberg, and her deceased husband was born about 12 miles from Tübingen. Before the war broke out in this country, they, with their small family of children, came hither and sought a home in the interior of Pennsylvania, about 100 miles from Philadelphia. The father was already advanced in years and too feeble to endure hard labor, but endeavored to instruct his children in the word of God, because in the thinly settled country districts few schools are to be found, or none at all. In the summer of the year 1755, the English General Braddock with his army was defeated by the French and the hostile Indians in the wilderness, because the English fought according to European methods and the Indians after the American. Immediately thereupon, the hostile Indians invaded the remote districts of Pennsylvania and butchered the scattered and defenseless inhabitants consisting mostly of poor German families, dragging their children through the trackless wilderness into captivity in their huts and caves. On October 16, 1755, this fate also befell the above-named Christian family, together with a number of our brethren in the faith. The mother, the widow now still living, and one of the sons had gone to a mill a few miles distant to secure the grinding of some grain. The father, together with the oldest son and two little daughters, remained at home. The Indians suddenly fell upon their house, slaying the father and the son in their usual barbarous manner, but they spared the two little girls, Barbara, twelve years of age, and Regina, then going on ten. They bound them and dragged them aside into the forest, leaving several Indians to guard the children. Within a few days, the Indians continued to bring an additional number of captive children together. After the mother and son returned home from the mill and found everything burned and in ruins, they fled further inland down to Reverend Pastor Kurt's congregation. The Indians, having now taken a number of children, set out for their own country, not by the usually traveled paths, but through rough and unsettled sections, so that they might not be taken from them. The larger children were compelled to carry the smaller ones who were strapped to their backs. Now they pursued their tiresome journey barefooted, over brushes, stones, briars, undergrowth, through mires and swamps. Some children's feet were worn to the quick, laying bare the bones and tendons so that they thought that they must die because of the agony and the sufferings which they endured, but they were urged on mercilessly. In going through the brushes and thickets their clothing was torn into shreds, and at last fell from them altogether. When they finally reached the country inhabited by the Indians, they were divided among them, one being given to a family here, and another to another several miles further on. It is the custom among these people, if perchance parents are deprived of their children in war, that they are replaced by the captives taken by them. When they had now proceeded about 400 English miles, the younger 10-year-old daughter, Regina, was separated from her sister, Barbara, who had been handed over to her family and was compelled to do more than 100 miles further with a 2-year-old child which she was compelled to carry strapped to her back. Finally, Regina also reached the end of her journey, and together with the child she was carrying was given over to an old, ill-tempered Indian woman, who had but one son as her support to be her slave for life. But he, the son, oft times did not return home for a week or even a longer period, and so neglected to provide for his mother. In consequence of this, the old woman demanded that Regina should provide sustenance or be put to death. 
The little helpless infant also clung to Regina and looked to her for comfort. They were entirely destitute of clothing, and the supply of provisions was very scant. When the worthless son was not at home, Regina was expected to see to everything if she did not wish to be scolded and beaten by the old hag, whose name was Wolfen. It was therefore necessary for her to drag together the wood by which they were warmed. When the ground was open, she looked for and dug up all manner of wild roots, artichokes, garlic, etc., and gathered the tender bark of trees and vegetables to preserve the family alive. When there was frost in the ground, she hunted all kinds of living creatures, such as wild rats, field mice, and other animals which she was able to capture, to satisfy the cravings of hunger. For more than nine years, she, together with the other little girl, was compelled to continue in this mode of life, not knowing whether she should ever return again. Through the first terrible calamity, when she was deprived of her father, mother, brothers, and sister, she was naturally benumbed. In the long journey with its attendant cruelties, the deprivation of all the necessaries and comforts at the hands of the Indians, in continual fear and the very shadow of death, there was no room for reflection, and she could not do more than preserve an animal existence. When, however, this miserable mode of existence had become second nature, and the powers of the soul were again brought into activity, the prayers, the passage of scripture, and the sacred hymns which she had learned from her parents became her chief delight. These divine truths were developed in her soul as a seed which begins to grow, sending its roots downward and its shoots upward, when the genial warmth of the sun causes the earth to produce life. Thus the word of God learned by her gradually expanded into life, and in her tribulation brought peace, rest, and comfort to her heart. The miserable mode of living was a good assistant and means of restraint to curb the sinful flesh and its growing desires, and the word of God implanted in her tender youth could so much the more readily promote the growth of the inner life. She stated that during the period of her captivity she had offered her prayers on bended knees, under the trees numberless times, with a child beside her uniting in prayer. Upon almost every occasion during the later years, she had a faint assurance and a gleam of hope that she would be released from captivity and brought back to Christian people. Among other things, the two following hymns had been and still were a constant source of comfort to her. Jesus evermore I love, and alone and yet not alone am I. When finally during the year just past, the fierce Indians were put to flight, and their homes attacked, especially by the prudent and brave Colonel Bouquet and his victorious army, and were compelled to sue for peace and to deliver their Christian captives, Regina and her foster child were released with the others. This was a remarkable event as a large number of the captives were brought to Colonel Bouquet in the midst of the trackless wilderness, the larger part being without any clothing. A beneficent charity was manifested, not only by the Colonel himself, but also by his people, in that they cut off the flaps of their coats and waistcoats, and cut up their blankets and so on to cover the absolute nakedness of the poor creatures, it being in the midst of winter. Then the kind-hearted Colonel Bouquet first brought the larger party of former captives from the country of the Indians to the English forts on the Ohio River known as Fort Pitt. There the same spirit of sympathy and humanity was manifested by the soldiers of the garrison. Whatever each one could spare of his scanty supply of food and clothing was bestowed upon these fellow creatures to cover their nakedness, to protect them against the cold, and to satisfy their hunger. This manifestation of human sympathy and its effects were certainly pleasant to contemplate, for whoever could find anything superfluous in the line of clothing or covering brought it forward. Flaps, capes, sleeves, pockets, collars, etc., not absolutely needed, extra lengths of blankets, shirts, or cravats, the officers vied with the rank and file of common soldiers in cutting and sewing, first to clothe their male fellow creatures, and afterwards to close up and patch their own garments. From Fort Pitt, the crowd of those rescued was finally brought into the province of Pennsylvania, to a village named Carlisle. Notice was given in all the papers that whoever had lost friends, relatives, husbands, wives, or children should be on hand and claim their own by proper signs. 
Accordingly, the above-mentioned poor widow with her only yet remaining son journeyed thither. She asked the commissioners for her little daughter, Regina, describing her as she was when between nine and ten years of age, but she could find no one resembling her among the crowd. For Regina now was more than 18 years of age, fully grown to womanhood, stout with the bearing of an Indian, and speaking their language. The commissioners asked the mother whether she could not designate some characteristic by which her daughter might be known. The mother replied in German that her daughter frequently sang the hymn, Jesus I love evermore, and alone and yet not alone am I in my dread solitude. Hardly had the widow said this when Regina sprang from among the others and repeated the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the hymns named. Finally, the mother and daughter fell upon each other's necks, shedding tears of joy. The mother with her daughter, whom she had again found, hastened to return home. The little girl for whom Regina had cared kept looking on and repeated the things which Regina had repeated, but no one could be found who recognized her as their own child. Hence it was thought that probably her parents had been murdered, but she was not willing to leave her foster mother and clung affectionately to Regina so that she could not be kept back. Because of the interest attached to this narrative, the location of the scene of the tragedy has been sought by various persons. It was generally supposed to have occurred on the northern confines of the present Lebanon County. At the request of the Lebanon County Historical Society, the writer of this read before its members on April 21st, 1901, a paper bearing upon the part taken by what is now Lebanon County in the French and Indian War, in the course of which mention was made of Regina. In December of the same year, the following item appeared in one of the daily papers. A movement has been started in Lower Schuylkill County for the erection of a monument to Regina Hartman, the heroine of a pathetic story familiar to all. The ruins of the Hartman home are one of the landmarks near Orwigsburg. Regina Hartman and her mother are buried in Christ Lutheran Cemetery near Stouchburg. It was claimed that she was the daughter of John Hartman who was born on June 20, 1710. Let the searcher for historic truth come and sit with us on the edge of the well that springs where stands the great old pine tree with its corona of a few branches high in the air, about a block or square northward from where the spire of St. Paul's Lutheran Church also points upward to the throne of him who heard and answered Magdalena Hartman's prayers for the safe return of Regina. And as we sit, we will dip and drink deep a cooling draft from the crystal sparkling spring while in vision entranced, we look and see once again the ending search of nine long years and behold the released captive Sakwehana, or White Lily, Regina's Indian name, half dispirited by surrounding strangeness, come over the hills from Carlisle with her mother at one hand and her Koloska, the short-legged bear, the Indian name of Susan Smith, her companion in captivity, at the other, until rising over the crest of the last hill that overlooks this sacred spot, the conscious revelation burst upon the memory curtain mind, as with hand uplifted and face lit up, she cries, What shock! What shock! The green tree! The green tree! Where she and her sister and mother had spent many happy hours in early childhood. Then the weary heart of the captive remembered and realized that it was home with mother, and when the witchery of that historic spot, with its halo of the story of Regina, shall hold us bound a moment longer ere it vanishes, we shall be convinced that the wine of sacrifice was not poured in vain, when it was poured to preserve that heritage that cost our forefathers and our motherhood the fearful price they paid for it. Cordially yours, H. A. Weller. So that's it for this episode. Here, Conrad Weiser told the governor about some of the depredations that had been committed in the Pennsylvania German settlements. And we heard about Regina Hartman, who was held in captivity for nine years. Henry Melcher Muhlenberg was an ancestor of the author of this book, and he indicated that Regina's last name was Hartman. However, other sources state that Regina's last name was Leininger. These sources also indicate that Regina's older sister Barbara's last name was Leininger. According to the website Find a Grave, Barbara escaped captivity after three and a half years. She then married Peter Ruffner on February 1, 1761, in New Holland, Pennsylvania, in Lancaster County. 
It's possible that Regina's mother, who is also named Regina, had remarried to a man with the last name of Hartman. Henry Melcher Muhlenberg said that he heard of the tale of Regina directly from her mother. If her last name was Hartman, then others, including Muhlenberg, may have inferred that her daughter's last name was also Hartman. Some memorials to Regina either just provide her first name or give both possible last names. This channel is called Unworthy History because we cover actual history that is now unworthy of being shown on history channels on TV. Those channels don't show actual history anymore. Stay tuned to this channel for more actual history about events like the French and Indian War and people like the early American settlers and the Native Americans. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.